Hello, uh, Sherry Lead. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. It's so great to be on here. It's so great. So for everyone listening, Sherry is a best-selling author of three books about friendship, which, which are amazing books. She's a life coach. She's a mom of two college kids, and she is a friendship expert. So we are so excited to have you here, Sherry. Thank you for being here. Yes, absolutely. So I guess my first question for you is, how did you get to this place where you finished your third book and you have this exciting new project, which we're going to talk about too in a bit, but how did you get to this place where you are, you know, really using your voice in such a beautiful way? Well, it didn't happen overnight. <laughs> I'll tell you that much. I, by training, I'm an attorney like yourself um, and stayed home with my kids for a little while. And I got to a point though, my kids, as you mentioned, are in college. So I got to a point that I can go back to work or do something and had the luxury that um, my husband, my family, we weren't relying on my income because we had been a single income family throughout uh, a lot of my kids' uh, youth. And so I actually got to decide what do I want to do? What, what fulfills me? And this happened in my 40s when I was making this decision. Um, and fast forward to age 50, I published my first book as the first book in the friendship series, which kind of happened by accident. But now it's a, it, I just finished the, I like to call it a trilogy. I think I can since there are three books. I just love that word. Uh, just finished the publication of my third book and I'll be turning 53 in 25 days. Congratulations and happy early birthday. Thank you. So what prompted you to focus on friendship? So the first book is called The 50-50 Friendship Flow. And uh, that name came from it because it was just a project. It sounds like an odd name for a book. And that's because it wasn't meant to be a book. It was my personal project between my 49th and 50th birthday when I decided to sit down with 50 women in my life uh, to share a meal with them and to tell them what I've learned from them with the belief that everyone we meet is both our teacher and our student. Uh, so because I'm an oversharer on social media, I shared these dates and people started to ask me, one, how did I come up with the 50 women? Two, uh, what prompted this and, and how did this experience make you feel and how could they do this themselves? And so this organically grew into a book. I love it. And then it, or it unfolded into two more books, which is just it, amazing. It did. During the pandemic, I decided, hey, I can do this. Now we were in my state. I live in Washington state. We were in lockdown like or, or stay at home orders and I thought, okay, I could do this again, but this time with Zoom and people with women that I know that aren't in my local area, and we can meet the way we're talking now. And so I met with another 50 women over Zoom, and that book I asked them, what is your mess that became your message? It was, um, it came, the idea came from listening to a Robin Roberts masterclass on communication. And she said, that's what her mom uh, always said to her, make your mess your message. And my publisher said at that point, after that book came out, that I had a series. I thought, well, that's stupid. It's two books. You can't have a series with two. And so then this third book was born. And now uh, that wraps up the series. But I love how you have taken like this curiosity. And I, I, I do want to go back to like what prompted you to, to go and interview these 50 women to begin with. But then you just followed that and you followed your curiosity and you followed what was fun for you. And you now you have made it a beautiful career. Yes, yeah, it, um, it it's grown into some more than I could imagine, and I think that's what happens sometimes when we we allow ourselves to just let things sort of unfold, right? And now it's it's turned into not just a book career. I'm also writing articles. Uh, I've been blessed with some speaking engagements, and it has become something greater than um than anything I could have dreamed of actually and I feel like it's given me a platform after 50 to get 
my purpose out there to get get this message of friendship out there. I love it. I love it. And, and obviously you're touching many, many people as you have a huge social media following. Mm-hmm. And it's so exciting to see how this is all unfolded for you. Mm-hmm. But I want to go back to mm-hmm. what like prompted you initially, because I think this could help so many people when they kind of, mm-hmm. you know, something strikes at us and it's like, oh, this has had a big impact on me and I want to do something about this. And a lot of people don't take that step, but you did. So I want to hear about that journey for you. Sure. So um, as I, so a few things happened kind of at the same time. And as I mentioned, I was going from 49 to 50. So it felt like I wanted to do something momentous and something big that year. So that's why the number 50 came up with 50 friends. But I had also um, come off of um, a cancer diagnosis and treatment for breast cancer that I was diagnosed with at age 47. And in fact, this January um, will be five years, no evidence of disease, I believe. So I'm looking forward to that, that visit. And on top of that, I had attended a memorial service for a girlfriend. And during that memorial service, they had an opportunity for people to stand up and say something about her. And it actually, even though they were saying these great, amazing things about her and telling these funny stories, it actually made me really sad to sit there because I thought, well, this is great, but she's not here to hear them. We, No one said these things to her or told her, you know, what in words, <laughs> face to face, what she's done in their lives. And I decided, I still remember this sitting there in that, it was a church, I was sitting there in that pew thinking, I'm going to change this. This is what I'm going to do this year. I'm going to let people know what I've learned from them and what they've, what changes they've brought to my life. That is amazing and so powerful. And so that was the the source of your first book. You went about mm-hmm. and you met with 50 women. And this is all during the pandemic as well. No, this was right before the pandemic. Okay. But the, by the time the book was published, uh, we were in the pandemic. <laughs> Got it. Got it. And so how did you find these 50 women. So I joke that my friendship bar is pretty low, <laughs> but really it's, it's, I'm joking about that because the, the the quality of friends is high, but these were women that either some were lifelong friends, others were more recent acquaintances. And I just jotted this down really quick. And it was nothing that I put a lot of thought into um, when I jotted, you know, this list of 50, there definitely could have been at this point, you know, a whole bunch of other women on this list. And the thing was, there was something about each of the names that I thought, okay, there's something that I've learned from them. And I know there is. A lot of times I didn't know exactly what that was, but I felt it. And so before these meetings, I set up these dates and these were all in person because it was right before the pandemic. I When I set up these dates, I really spent that week, because this happened over a course of a year, I spent that week really thinking about that woman and uh, what she brought into my life and figuring out how I was going to convey to her what she what she meant to me, because I wanted to make sure I conveyed the message and the feeling, um, for lack of better words, correctly. So she really understood uh, the impact she has in this world. And Oftentimes it became an emotional conversation and I have many, I remember all these, these meetings where women, um, a lot of times apologize for crying, um, because it, it, it impacted them to hear these words and to be seen. How beautiful to be the recipient Mm -hmm. of just somebody saying, this is how you've touched my life. And I just love how this memorial service really prompted you because you're right. So often we don't hear beautiful words from others. They may think it. I know I certainly think of beautiful things of so many friends. How often do I actually tell them? Not often enough. And just our conversation, you are really inspiring me. Yeah. And it's, you know, I won't say it's easy. It gets easier because you're right. We don't do this. So I'm not going to lie. It could be awkward at first, but What I tell people to do is to make this a challenge for themselves. You could be, it doesn't have to be 50. Maybe it's next year in 2023, you want to meet with five friends that are in your life or five people in your life to tell them what you've learned from them. And you could set these dates by couching it in, in, or framing it 
um, that you decide to make this your challenge. Because if you say that, then it makes it a little bit easier to get together and everyone wants you to finish a challenge. They just do. And it helps them um, understand exactly what you're doing. And it takes a little bit of that awkwardness away of trying to set up these dates. I love it. I love it that you're, you know, you're making it playful for people mm -hmm. so that they don't feel like all this pressure, right? It's just like, mm -hmm. hey, be a part of my um, my personal challenge to do this. That is yes, a really... And I, and I think the big piece too, it, you don't have to be an overshare on social media like I am, but memorialize these dates that you have because the reflection piece, when you look back and you see, you know, whether it's in writing, a quick picture, whatever it is, when you look back and see the people, especially, you know, women that have come into your life that um, have taught you things, it's it's pretty humbling and uh, it, it's, it makes you realize that a lot of, um, a lot of what we receive is, is little with what we've done, but there's gifts everywhere. It's so beautiful. You also talk about in your books too, reaching out through Facebook and finding some of these people, right? And I think that's just such a beautiful message too, because quite often social media can be seen so negatively and there's a lot of, a lot of negativity at times, mm -hmm. and unless you choose to use it differently, which of course you do, but you also use to, to truly be social and build relationships. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so some of these women, I felt like I knew because we had connected on social media, especially at the time through Facebook. Uh, I was a relatively new e uh, user on Facebook when it started or became more popular. So I'd been on it for a long time. And some of these women, we had gone back and forth, you know, liking each other's things, commenting and basically watching our lives. And so some of those women I reached out to uh, because I considered them a friend to sit down with them and to actually meet in person. A social media friend uh, was pretty remarkable, too. And to let them know, hey, I, I watched you go through X, Y and Z and the way you handled it taught me this. Or I cool. love the way you present and, and the way you celebrate your family or whatever it is. Beautiful. What, what is the biggest change for you now that you've done this through your interviews with all these different women and including like with your making meaning out of your mess and um, ask yourself this, what has been the biggest change for you? There's been so many practical changes. And there's also been a lot of bigger grand. So the big grand change for me is now it's easy for me to walk into a room of strangers and make a friend. I know I can do it. Uh, and it's because this excitement that I now carry with this belief that everyone we meet is our teacher and our student really has changed the way I approach people. I am very excited to meet someone knowing that we are supposed to meet at that moment. And so it's changed the way my relationships. So that's one thing. It's changed my relationships and the way I interact with people and the way I feel I belong in this world. So I am, I, I was orphaned as a child. I was raised as, as a baby. I was raised as an only child. And um, I'm someone that uh, when I was orphaned, I was left without a birth date, a birth name, or a birthplace. I was adopted from South Korea. So I always had this feeling growing up that I wanted to find connection. I wanted to find where I belonged. I uh, oftentimes didn't feel like I belonged anywhere. I didn't look like the other people I grew up with. I didn't look like maybe family members. Um, I didn't look like at people at the church I was raised in. And through this process, one, I realized I belong. I absolutely belong. I belong in whatever room I'm in. I belong with whoever I'm sitting with. I can find connection with those around me and they don't have to be blood related to me. So that was the big thing uh, for me to find. On a practical note, the way it's changed my life, for example, I have in Make Your Mess Your Message, I spoke to my former paralegal who I hadn't spoken to in 20 plus years. I knew her kids when they were very little. And in this conversation, she told me about her son who's battled drug addiction and ended up on the streets and their battle as a family. And this was a kid that was in sports. He went to college. Um, 
just kind of this all American family that you wouldn't think that this was the family with the kid on the streets that was addicted to drugs. It made me change the way I saw people on the streets because I had become fairly numb to seeing people on the streets. I live in Seattle, just like many big uh, cities, we have a, a, a homeless problem. From that conversation, I've started to, I started carrying backpacks with supplies in my car. Now, instead of uh, looking away at the stoplights, I, I roll down my window and I hand over a backpack. And in that short time at the stoplight, I've had the most amazing conversations and smiles with, with the individuals on the, on the side of the road. And that, you know, those are the kind of things that on a day-to-day -day basis because of these conversations, my life and the way I conduct myself has changed. Oh my God. That is so beautiful and so inspiring about the backpacks. And also, I think such a universal truth you, and I know through my work in coaching as well, sometimes people share with you, it's just so surprising that the struggles that they have, but you know, they're not telling everyone is, is, mm -hmm. you know, I like what Brene Brown says that not everyone deserves to hear your story. And of course, you know, there's privacy, but like everyone has a struggle or struggles mm -hmm. and you just don't see them all the time. And if you recognize that, I think you just become so much more, I think, compassionate and aware, but you have to remember that. Yeah. Uh, you know, I have a girlfriend who spoke to me about, I, I've known her for years. I had no idea she's dealt with daily anxiety and depression since her teenage years. I had no idea. Yes. And, you know, she told me that she literally talks herself out of bed every day and she's done this since she's a teenager. And I used to think, oh, maybe I can't rely on her to show up for a party because she always cancels and maybe she's not reliable or maybe she's, for lack of a better word, flaky. After having this conversation with her, I recognize and I learned that no, it's the opposite. When she shows up, she did something really strong and it changed. It made me understand anxiety better. And it also did. It gave me a sense of grace and it started to make me think about the people who don't always show up for those meetings or a cancel. And, and it made me realize, well, maybe they are suffering for some, something like anxiety, something that I don't understand. And so instead of being down when they don't show up, I can celebrate when they're strong enough to show up. And it's having these conversations has absolutely been a life changer for me. I love that. It's so beautiful. It's just that the saying, you know, everyone has a struggle we don't know about. I think is just a powerful, powerful reminder. And so often people's actions have nothing to do with you and that people, and it's hard to remember sometimes, especially if somebody's not kind to you or whatever, but you know, just most people are doing the best they can in the moment. It's so funny how little somebody's <laughs> actions have to do with you. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. And we usually don't, especially for women. Mm -hmm. We're, uh, we tend to be, I know I do, I don't want to speak for you, but more people pleasers and, you know, somebody doesn't do something and, and we think it's about us mm -hmm. and usually has nothing to do with us or very little. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And when, and when, when we start to realize that, and this is what I've learned through my friends too, when we start to realize that, uh, it sure makes relationships and friendships a whole lot easier. Oh, for sure. For sure. What would you say for women who don't have the kind of friends that you have and are, are middle-aged, 50 plus, and they want to have more meaningful friendships? What tips or advice would you um, tell them to do? It takes, it takes work. It takes time to really cultivate friendships. I think, you know, I, I saw a study, a study that out of Kansas that said uh, a professor, I think it was Kansas, it, one of the universities in Kansas, I don't want to say the wrong university, but uh, he found that takes about 50 hours to go from a casual acquaintance to a casual friendship, and then more hours to establish a deeper friendship. And uh, that seems like a lot, a lot of time. So when you have to put time into it, but you can fast forward that a little bit. And a couple of things that I like to suggest to people to do is one, do something that scares you. In, in other words, talk to people, you know, challenge yourself to maybe say hello after a gym class or something like that. If it, You know, do something that scares you a little bit uh, to think of people as just friends you haven't met yet, as opposed to strangers. Mm -hmm. And 
um, one of the lessons I learned when I met this woman for the first time, she greeted me as if I was already a friend. So I started doing that when I greet people too. I so I think, okay, this is just a friend I haven't met yet. And that has fast forwarded a lot of my friendships. And the third is really believe, and because I believe it's true, I hope you do too, or I hope your listeners do too, that everyone we meet is our teacher and our student. And when we greet people with that mindset, it, it puts the, um, excitement into the meeting and just knowing that it kind of changes the energy and that helps build friendships as well I mean it's you got to put the time in there's no there's no no way around that but you can kind of speed things up with the energy you bring to that relationship and the mindset I love that I love the mindset that mindset that everyone's a friend I haven't met yet you know Mm -hmm. just to really have that because you're like oh you know and then it just I think it just allows you to be more curious about them. And it takes the pressure off of you because I know that I used to, when I met someone, um, kind of do this dance of, okay, are they safe for me to to be friendly to? Do they think that I appear, you know, like somebody they would want to be friends with? Or how are they looking at me? Uh, and it going in it with that different mindset takes the pressure off me, allows me to be more open and excited, genuinely excited about me and them. And gosh, you get what you give. And I, you know, it's just like a smile is contagious. That energy that you bring to that meeting, it's just as contagious. And unless something's really bad is going on in the other person's life, they almost can't help but give you that energy back. I love it. And I love that everyone's a teacher, uh, you know, everyone's your teacher. And your student, that, that is so beautiful too. I certainly believe like everyone's my teacher, even, mm-hmm. you know, no matter who it mm-hmm. is, everyone's my teacher because I can learn something from them. Yeah, that's what we're here to do, right? Learn from each other and connect with each other. Yes. You also talk about, which I really appreciate as well, that like, it's okay to end friendships. You know, mm-hmm. it's, you don't have to be friends with somebody forever. And like, it's okay, it's okay to you know, and them when it's right for you. Can you say more about that? Yeah, well, having a um, a difficult relationship is unhealthy for you, for one. So it's not healthy. You can feel in your body. So a lot of times I'll tell clients, trust your gut. You know, you feel it. You, you might, sometimes our, our minds will talk us into relationships and and tell us it's wrong to end a relationship, but our gut knows it. We feel it in our body when we get that angst, when the number pops up on our phone, or we know we're going to go up to a place to meet that person that is no longer healthy for us. And we spend so much time as parents, you know, teaching our kids how to make friends. We we go to these play groups, these friend groups, we, we talk about friendships. And for some reason, we don't treat teach our children how to end friendships. And we get this idea that it's negative. It's wrong to end friendship. You're you're a bad person if you end a friendship. That is not true. We're not meant to be in all relationships forever. Um, because sometimes just like a teacher and a student, we're just there's a reason why we're there for a while and it's okay to leave that relationship. And so uh we need to we need to talk about it and be okay with with ending relationships. You know, it doesn't have to be a negative thing. We right. All grow, and, yeah, we all grow and change at, at different rates. We're not meant to necessarily walk life together with the same group of people. When would you like suggest to end a friendship? I say, you know, trust your gut, your gut knows. Mm-hmm. And and if you know, you feel that angst when you think about that person, if, you know, the phone number comes up on your phone and you don't want to call them back and that's the last thing you want to do, or you're thinking that in a party you want to avoid them or you can't believe they're going to be there, that's, that, your body's telling you something, you could feel it. Uh, so I think the first step is to trust your gut and figure out where that's coming from. Mm-hmm. And and it's like that saying, what, uh, when you recognize that you're part of the problem. Like, you know, what do they say? You're, you're not stuck in traffic. You are the traffic. When you recognize your role and and you're honest with yourself that, okay, this is something that I don't like. I don't want this person, you know, for some reason I'm having this physical response. When you recognize that, then you could be honest with yourself and think, okay, where is that coming from? Yes. I love that. And I love how you say in your book, you have the question of where am I not recognizing I am part of the problem for anything, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, what, you know, once because 
then, you know, we take responsibility as opposed to blame shift, because when we blame shift, we're giving away, we're giving our power to someone else for the solution. Um, but yeah, the recognition is the, is the first step. And, right. and if you think, if you close your eyes and think, okay, what would it feel like if this person was in my life and you actually physically kind of feel a weight being lifted, that probably is a good sign that it may be time to end the friendship or at least step away for a while. Right. Right. I love that. What helps you listen to your intuition, especially high achieving women who are very analytical. They sometimes have this war between, you know, the thoughts and analyzing and, and not just simply trusting their gut. So or even knowing what that is, right. Cause we're so not used to, to uh, exercising that part of us because we're in our heads so much. Uh, it's hard to make that head and heart connection if we're not out of practice. So sometimes I, so I'll tell clients to practice this, even do these like silly steps of going to the grocery store and, and picking up two pieces of fruit. And what, what does your, what does your body tell you? What do you want? I mean, it's a little bit silly, but it gets you into the practice of remembering to listen to your body as well as your mind. And for me, Personally, I know that I need to listen to my body when I start to feel angst. That's my trigger button. When I start to feel angry, it usually for me means that I must feel like I'm stuck, like I don't have a choice, that something that I'm being wronged. And I believe that we always have choice or options. So when I get angry, as long as I can catch myself, I'm not always perfect with this. But when I start to get angry and angst, that's my trigger to to take a step back and detach and listen to my body um, to say, okay, what am I feeling here? Why do I feel like I'm stuck? And am I really stuck? No. What can I do? I love it. So it's a combination. It sounds like for you, which is really powerful of listening to your body, checking in, starting really small, right? Small things like testing something at the supermarket, what feels better for my body. Mm -hmm. But then the second piece is then like really questioning you know, how I'm, how am I contributing to this? Mm -hmm. I think the more that we can take responsibility in a moment like that, the more powerful we are in making ourselves happier. Yeah. Because then we have, right. If, if we have responsibility, that must mean we have power and we're not the victim of something or at the effect of something else. Um, so absolutely. When we take that responsibility, no matter how uncomfortable that is, we're also taking our power, you know, because we have power now to, to, write this wrong. I love it. So you strike me as just being such a confident person. And I'm just really curious as whether you've ever struggled with imposter syndrome, like I know I have, and many women I've worked with have struggled with it. Men too, but I think women especially um, struggle with this. Um, have you ever struggled with it? And could you tell us about it? I think most of my life, especially my young, young professional life as a, an attorney coming out of law school and starting to practice at 24, uh, I definitely struggled with imposter syndrome and uh, even being an uh, um, ethnically minor, ethnic minority woman and showing up in places where people don't look like me and feeling like I, I stuck out at a table. Um, I definitely did struggle with imposter syndrome. In fact, this has been a process for me as I've gotten older and we do tend to get we get more confident as women I believe as we as we get older and sitting down with 144 women over the last three years for this project for these books made me realize that um, when I belong uh, to that it really took away that feeling of imposter syndrome and made me understand. It's funny that you say the word confidence because that word was said to me not too long ago too. They, somebody said, well, Sherry, you're so confident. And I was blown away that they actually saw me like that. And they said that because I realized all my life, I never would have put the word confidence with myself, but I thought about it. And I thought, yeah, they're right. I am confident. And why am I confident? I'm confident because I've talked to so many women and I've sat down with them and I realized we all, we all go through the same things. We all, we all have the same, there's very little that separates us. Even if we might not agree in beliefs or we might look very different, there is very little that separates us at the core. Yes. Uh, and knowing that and knowing that takes away the feelings of judgment that, and judgment was the piece that, that stripped my confidence. You know? mm. And of course, being in a 
often predominantly male profession as the law, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Even though it's changed, it's still not in terms of leadership with women and dollars in terms of what women make. It's hard to maintain your confidence, mm-hmm. I think. I know my that was my experience as well as a lawyer for many years um, because you're surrounded by often white males. Mm-hmm. And the, you know, the great thing about about recognizing that you belong is, you know, especially if you're surrounded by an office of white males and you not, are not a white male, you have a unique voice that they need. And that's one motivation for me as far as imposter syndrome uh, is not to let imposter syndrome take away the world from hearing my unique voice. And I think about the leaders and the people that I admire, even the attorneys, right? The great litigators, they're very unique in their style. The celebrities that we love, there's something unique about them. And when we think about that and what makes great leaders and people we admire, it's their uniqueness. And if we buy into this imposter syndrome and let it take over us, we're depriving the world of our unique voice. And at midlife, we, we need to, you know, this is... This we've learned so much and we have so much to share that this is the time that we need to say bye to that imposter syndrome. We don't, it's not serving us any longer. Be done with it. Be done with it. Mm-hmm. Amen. I couldn't agree more. Um, and you and thank God you you have because you wouldn't have produced these beautiful books mm-hmm. and sharing your message with the world and impacting so many women to um really take the step to start using their voice and also to connect beautifully with the beautiful women in their life. Yeah. And I hope, you know, knowing that this started for me at age 50 and I met another author, he was uh, a very, a very well uh, published author with a big publishing company. Books come out immediately in several languages. Uh, documentaries were written about him. I met him. He published his first book in his late sixties. Okay. So uh, there's a lot to be done from, we have a lot to be done from midlife on. I think that's our time to really shake up the world. I love it. And you've been so prolific in just like three <laughs> years. How how did you do that? What has kept you going and motivated? And I'm excited. You know, I can't, I can't say I was excited when I was practicing the law, but I'm genuinely excited. And Every time I do something now, my goal is to change one person's life. I, I, I'm always trying to speak to that one person and um, hoping that there will be a ripple effect. So, for instance, maybe, you know, coming on here, I might I, thinking, OK, there's there's one woman who is thinking that she's going to write that book or she, you know, she has that project. She's just not sure because there are younger people out there doing it or whatever or has been done before. Yes, maybe it has, but it hasn't been done by you and it hasn't been done in your voice. Um, so my hope always is to, you know, that keeps me going is that I need to change that next person's life or I have a message that somebody needs to hear. I love it. And we need to hear their messages too. And we need Mm -hmm. them to step up and be their full authentic selves and share their stories and their messages for the world. Yes. What would you say to the woman who is maybe working full time, doesn't have the luxury of, you know, having like, you know, and has a family, doesn't have the luxury of just having lots of time to like, find her purpose and joy right now, what would you say to her? But, but she feels nonetheless that she does have a message. What, mm. what, what advice would you give to her? Well, first of all, I think journaling is the best self-coaching tool. So I would suggest that she start journaling. Uh, it doesn't have to, it could even be by audio. You know, she's a busy person. It could be, she decides every day while she's driving to work that she's going to audio jur- journal about that day or on the way home um, or written or whatever form it is and start to notice themes that come up through that. You know, what keeps on coming up? What do you want? You know, what what are you passionate about? What are you working on? And just start to listen and and start to see, recognize that whatever place, and I'm assuming because you said finding her passion, that she's not working in her passion right now, start to look at where you're working as an opportunity, because you you could, you know, you could experience the same job with either rose colored glasses on or, you know, dark gloomy glasses on. And when you decide that, okay, I'm here, there's, I'm here to learn, Mm -hmm. then you start to see opportunity. 
I love that. So I could not agree with you more with journaling. It is accelerated therapy, accelerated coaching. I have all my clients. I, I really <laughs> encourage them to do that because um, the act of writing slows down our brain. Mm -hmm. And when we can see what's in our brain, right, we can start changing what we need to change. Um, but then your second point, too, of just seeing where there is opportunity um, where you currently are right now, that's really powerful as well. Yeah. And just take a small step, um, a, a small little step. And it doesn't even have to be in the right direction. So it has, doesn't have to be towards something that's passionate, but something new and novel. It doesn't have to take a lot of time. It could even be an online course, but just taking a small step starts to trigger something in the brain that that's the creative center that continues to want to learn and grow. And um, if you listen, things start coming towards you. You know, this, that's what happened with me with these books and sitting down with these women. I didn't plan for this to be a career. I planned to be a life coach. I didn't plan to be an author, a writer, a speaker, and things began to unfold when I started to listen. And your quote, do what you love and you'll feel the joy of aligning with your true self. I mean, mm -hmm. that is so powerful because that's what you've, you have followed. You've, you've let it unfold. You're like, okay, I, you know, first I want to start with these women and then the, the next book, you know, kind of asking a different question. And then your third book, you know, with more women asking, mm -hmm. you know, more powerful questions, which, you know, just the act of that itself, right, can mm -hmm. change us all, right, those questions. Oh, yeah. And just having these conversations that we don't normally have with our girlfriends or our friends. Uh, absolutely. It, it changes the way you see the world and the way you, you show up in the world. And it makes it so the differences that we all have with each other, one another, seem so small to Yes. Compared to our similarities and where we can and find connection. My God, this is what we need more in the world, right? How mm -hmm. we are more alike mm -hmm. uh, in our humanity than different. Um, yes. And that's such a beautiful message to spread. What would you have? This is one of your questions. What would you have on your headstone? Oh, so I used to want to have, um, I told you I was sick. <laughs> <laughs> because I thought it'd be funny, but then I thought, oh, that'd be bad if I actually was sick and I died and that'd be kind of mean. So, um, you know, I think that I actually hadn't thought about this or maybe I hadn't, and I've forgotten, but what comes to mind is, uh, she, she made a difference by being a friend. Oh, beautiful. Very beautiful. You have really overcome so many challenges from, you know, or gone through maybe just, you know, the fact of being adopted, abandoned as an infant, um, having a double hip replacement, your breast cancer diagnosis, a head on collision, which was quite very serious. Mm -hmm. And yet you have seemed to have channeled all of those experiences into really creating a life of joy. Mm -hmm. Is that a fair yeah. statement? Every time something has happened and the most recent was the breast cancer experience uh i've thought okay my first thought is what am i supposed to learn there must be a reason here what am i supposed to learn what what's the learning piece and i honestly don't know where that came from for me but that's always been my my go-to response but it has helped me and changed my mindset in dealing with whatever life throws me recognizing that there's a learning piece and I'm supposed to do something with this. That being said, I've been telling the universe, can I just learn through podcasts? I don't need to actually experience the next one. Um, but yeah, just focusing on that learning piece has really made these struggles something that's made my life better because of them. I love it. And I think, gosh, that's so inspiring. I, I try to ask the question. I don't always successfully do this, but when something quote bad happens, I try mm -hmm. to keep asking myself the question, how could this be a good thing? Mm -hmm. And quite often I don't come up with anything at first, <laughs> Yeah, but if I keep asking the question, stuff will come up and it just, mm -hmm. again, takes us, takes me out of like being a victim to, you know, the circumstance, whatever that is. Yeah. And we don't, it may not be, you know, it may not be as grand and in our face so that we know oh yeah this is what we got because of this 
it, we could be affecting somebody else's life that we don't know of, you know, the simple thing of uh, being stuck in traffic. We don't know if we're stuck in traffic because if we were not in that place, maybe we would have been, if we were quicker, we would have been in that accident. Or we don't know why these things happen to us or who they're affecting. But if we believe that there is a reason that um, there's something we could learn from this, or maybe some, something that someone else could learn, our relatives, our friends, from watching our experience, uh, then, then that makes things a little more um, palatable. Yeah, and it's it's more powerful, and it's a, certainly a more positive way to go through life than feeling like everything's happening to you. Mm-hmm. Instead of, we can all have the belief that things are happening for us, which is, again, not always our initial thought, not mine always. Yeah. And then, and you know, we were talking midlife, we have so much experience and we, and when I asked these questions, what is the mess that became your message? A lot of times the women had not reflected on their mess because during that time of mess, they were just trying to get out of it and survive. So they never had a chance until the time we sat down to reflect back on the mess that got them to where they are or what the message was. So this is also a great exercise and recognizing how much our past experiences have led us to who we are now and how different we are because of them. Um, And being able to have that power and change some of our belief systems that we had about ourselves when we were younger, because we're we're so much stronger, more confident. We, We have this experience. And I think that's what you know, makes midlife an exciting time to do these things that we want, do these new careers, go out and make a difference in our communities because we have all this experience that we've gone through. Yes, this experience and, you know, and your experience is not the same for many other people who may have done the same things you have done in terms of the law or, you know, the challenges you have faced. And it's so powerful to hear from your perspective because, I think that's what unites us because we all have different experiences. And Mm -hmm. um, I think many of us, I know probably most of us at some point, at least, you know, from women that I talk to, we feel at some point we don't belong. Mm -hmm. And um, it's so powerful to hear like how this whole process has made you feel like you belong no matter what. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's um, it's, it's been really powerful. And as you know, next year, I'm going to find I belong everywhere. I'm, I'm traveling all 50 states next year to meet one woman in each state to share a meal. And these are all women I either don't know or have had very little to no contact with in the last 35 years. And um, I'll be going to places I never thought I would, I would visit. And I think it's going to be remarkable to learn um how these women feel that you know they belong where they feel they are in the world is it different when you're in a small town in the south versus you know upstate new york or um you know mid the midwest do we do we experience family communities are, are there differences what's similar do we experience aging differently <laughs> um i i'm just very excited to again you know move forward and connect with uh with friends i haven't met yet that is so exciting. So you're starting this in January of 2023. Is that right? Yes. Mm-hmm. Awesome. And how have you found these 50 women that you're going to, you're going to go to every single state? I am. Um, and so my first, my first, uh, I got 27 on my own through women that I worked with at some capacity over the last three years, but I've never met in person. Women like my web, my web designer, or uh, this woman who does audio for my, for my books. I, she's in California. She runs now a voice studio. So when I go down there, she's going to give me a voice lesson. I can't sing worth anything. So uh, that'll be a new experience. Um, so I was able to receive 27 through my own contacts. And then From there, I went to friends and said, hey, this is what I'm doing. So I got most of them through through the rest of them through that. And I had maybe six states left. And in that process, I reached out to some social media groups or some groups I'm in and said, hey, anyone know somebody in the Dakotas in West Virginia (laughs) Um, and, and finished it up that way. I love it. And the goal is, tell me if I'm wrong, the goal is to see, like, these are women you don't know very, you either don't know them or you don't know them very well. And just to see what kind of connection you can build and how you're alike and different. 
Yeah, I was commenting the other day that some of these women probably have never had a meal, shared a meal with an Asian person. Mm. Um, and uh, I certainly have not shared a meal with with somebody from Montana, actually, you know, in their state before. I mean, it's the country has been so divided, you know, in the last three years, we, you know, with the pandemic, we not only had to figure out who we felt safe with in our physical space, but we also figured out who we feel safe with emotionally, mentally, um, and, and everything our country has gone through that I just want to do something very different to, to, to connect and, and show that we can look very different because these women I'm meeting with were from different education levels different ethnic backgrounds, different economic backgrounds, big cities, small cities, uh, different um, um, uh, marital status, you know, careers, everything is so diverse. And to be able to say, sit down and go, we can find a connection despite what we believe politically, what we believe religiously, you know, what we look like, we can find a connection and we can really care about, about each other during this meal. That is so beautiful. So it's it's not about whether you agree politically or not. It's just mm -hmm. about, you know, how are we connected? How are we mm -hmm. more alike than different? And I, you know, I'm not curious about people's political or religious beliefs, but I am interested in whether or not they believe the same as their parents. And if they do, has that is that their community? Or did they go away from that belief and come back? Or at what age did that happen? So I'm not so concerned, curious about exactly what they believe, but is that the community? Do they believe the same as their friends and family? And is, do they believe this way? Because the people they love believe this way. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it isn't about our differences or caring about what each other believes, because when it comes down to it, you know, we're all trying to do the same thing. We're trying to find, you know, maybe the meaning of life. We're trying to find connection, happiness, and uh, just really uh, care about the people we love. I love that, though, because you're not, it's not like you're challenging or disagreeing with their mm -hmm. beliefs. You're just like, hey, you're curious. You're approaching it with a curiosity oh, this is why you believe what you believe. And gosh, if we could all do that in our world, we would have more harmony, wouldn't we? Yeah, you know, you the two justices, Scalia and Ginsburg, right? They're so opposite. They were so opposite in their beliefs, yet you saw after they passed away, they were the best of friends. So if Scalia, Justice Scalia and Justice uh, Ginsburg could have that type of friendship, why can't we have that friendship with, with uh, people who have differing beliefs? than us, you know, we find so a common ground. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So beautiful. I mean, they, they went on vacations together with their families. <laughs> I mean, they had dinners together all the time. They really, um, they disagreed, but it was very respectful. It was very respectful. It was very, and, and they had humor about it, which was so beautiful. Yeah. And yeah. I think that's the key. I, I tell one of my friends, you know, you're the Scalia to my Ginsburg <laughs> and, and we laugh about it. And, and I know, you know, despite our beliefs, if something happened to me or something happened to her, we would be right there for each other. Yes. I have friends like that too. We, we don't agree. And, you know, several things that are really important to me, mm -hmm. but I see their heart and they see mine and that's what matters, right? Because we mm -hmm. are just you know, it's like, you know, I know they're a good person, despite the fact that we might agree on something and they would do anything for me. And I feel the same. So it like, it, it doesn't matter at the end of the day, we can disagree, but we can do it with, you know, in a respectful way. Mm -hmm. and, and as we get, as we get older, we really don't want to waste our time disagreeing with people. <laughs> you know, I love, no. the quote, I love the question, if this were the last day of my life, would I, would I be doing what I'm doing now? And would it be fighting with you? No, it wouldn't be. So uh, I, would, I would much rather be laughing with you. I love it. Speaking of which, which I just thought this was so great when you mentioned um, in one of your books about every year with your husband, you've been married 25 years. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yes. 25 okay. years. Yeah. And every year you have a meeting on your anniversary mm -hmm. to decide if you're going to stay together for the following year. Yes. Yeah. Make it a choice. Right. So, so nobody, no, so nobody feels, um, nobody feels like they're stuck. And so it's always an option. So this started after our 20th wedding anniversary and it had been a particularly difficult, in my mind, it was a difficult year. Apparently he was just sailing through. <laughs> 
but I know, you know, things are bothering me, like the way he was walking and the, uh, the sounds that he was making in the house, you know, and I realized one day I'm not dealing with this with grace. I'm feeling like I'm stuck, you know, I, I had been staying at home and, and the kids and everything else. I felt like I was stuck and I realized, okay, I'm not stuck. And so let's have this meeting. Do we want to do this again next year? And he hates this meeting, but we have it every single year, recognizing this is a choice. We are choosing to be in this relationship, even though, you know, we've built a house, uh, we have a house, we have all these financial ties together, we have our kids, we have everything, but that's not an excuse to stay together. We're making a choice to stay together because we want to. So yes, every year we have this meeting. He hates this meeting, but we do this every year. And so far it's always been a yes, let's do this again. And it really does change the dynamics of, um, of the feeling of marriage. Again, it, you know, just what resonates for me, what, when you talk about all this is like how much you take responsibility for everything, including like, Mm -hmm. you know, your marriage, it's like, you're asking, okay, is this what we really want? You're not just, Mm -hmm. you're living very intentionally, which is so beautiful to see. And do you guys ever make changes? Do you make changes based on the conversation or is it? You know, we, we haven't made changes, but our life has kind of changed with our kids having gone away to college. So we became officially became, because my son goes to school in California and California schools were, uh, at least his college was remote. So he was at home an extra year doing college remotely. Um, so we officially became empty nesters last year. So life has just kind of changed by circumstance of where our kids are and also my career now, you know, and my career has changed and it's growing. And, uh, my husband, I met in law school, he's a practicing attorney. So life circumstances has changed for us. We're doing a little more traveling as a couple and um enjoy enjoying this new phase of life i love it and i just love the intentionality that you bring to it which is um really powerful because just knowing you're not stuck in anything is just a way for mm-hmm. having you know more freedom in your life yeah it, you know and it changed so many people in, in the long-term marriages or marriages in general especially when when uh, spouse is staying home with the kids really feel they it's easy to feel stuck and that's yeah. never a good it's that's never a good feeling yeah right well this conversation has been so fun and so inspiring to me and I'm sure inspiring to so many people about especially women and their friendships and using their voice is there anything that we haven't talked about that you want to share more of uh, no, I just would love to challenge your listeners to make a commitment to meet, you know, when the, within the next year to meet, it doesn't have to be 50 people, it could be five, you know, even two other people, but meet with, make a commitment to meet with people in your life, to tell them what you've learned from them, um, what a difference they made in your life, uh, because you will not only change your life with that conversation and deepen your friendship, but you'll also change the life of the person that you're talking to. So beautiful. I love it. Um, And where can everyone find you? Make sure we make that clear. My website is, it's a mouthful. It's an imperfectly perfect life. And I can be found on social media under that same name and imperfectly perfect life. The books are on Amazon um, friendship series, Sherry lead. Uh, They're also available other, uh, other online stores. Yes. And you're on Facebook, social uh, LinkedIn, um, Twitter. I'm even on TikTok. (laughs) Oh my gosh. I'm so impressed. I am not, (laughs) I'm, I'm far from the social media maven, but (laughs) there you go. Um, The books are so good. They're so inspiring. I I feel like I learned something from every woman that you have interviewed and you've inspired me to tell the women I love in my life, what they mean to me. And I really appreciate it. And also, I just love this idea. Everyone's a friend that even if it's a stranger, everyone's a friend and, you know, that we can go out and just meet new people and just be curious about them and, and develop a friendship and learn from them. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for having this conversation with me. And um, I love everything that you do and inspiring women and women in our just amazing middle age years of life. Amazing. Right. And it's so mm-hmm. exciting. And thank you for setting such a beautiful example. And thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you.